the book of Judges in chapter 3. So get your Bibles open there. Uh, Judges chapter 3 tonight. Uh, I'm sorry, 4. Judges chapter 4. We finished 3 last time. Um, Judges chapter number 4. The book of Judges, one of the most amazing books in the Bible. If you've been with us so far, you begin to see a pattern after a while of up and down. Get right, get delivered, fall. Get right, get delivered, fall. That's a picture of nations. That's a picture of individuals. You, you really get blessed. The Lord really blesses you. And then you take it for granted and mess up and fall. And then you cry out, oh God, help me. And then he helps you. And then you do real good for a while and fall. And then you say, oh God, help me. And he helps you. And then you do real good for a while and fall. And if the truth is, most of us would admit tonight that you see yourself in that. Nations, churches, individuals, marriages, everything. Churches go through times when they're really on fire and then they start taking it for granted, quit praying, bam, down on your face. So tonight here in chapter number four, uh, we're going to see that again. The book of Judges teaches the great law of human collapse. And you know what that is? It's a slap in the face of evolution. Uh, it means this. Everything gets worse unless something intervenes. Everything. Nothing gets better by itself. Everything. The sun's burning out. You watch. It's running down. These lights are going out. Nothing gradually gets better by itself. One nut got in there and said, well, the solar system is not a, a closed system because the sun gives energy. And you watch what happens if the sun shines on something from now on. It destroys it. It'll destroy it. Uh, everything's going down. Everything's going down. And evolution teaches the very opposite. As a matter of fact, uh, they, the world teaches opposite of everything God says in the Bible. Everything God said. Uh, there's a man here at church not long ago. Only come one time. He's never been to church like this in his life. He's from New York. And they, uh, uh, he told some people, he said, uh, I wish I could believe. He said, I wish I could believe. And so I, I told my daughter to send him the video on that atheist delusion. And she sent it, and he watched it. And uh, uh, it helped him. But he said he still has questions. And he says, how did, how did all the people in the world come from Adam and Eve? How can you answer that question? I thought, can you imagine that? How's an atheist? They, they believe they all come from a rock and don't know where the rock come from. I mean, think about that. Uh, but you, it shows how the God of this world has blinded the minds, not the eyes, the minds of them that believe not. And boy, we are seeing it today. Um, uh, I'm not preaching. I've been getting a lot of comments on preaching, especially Sunday morning when I preached on uh, uh, about what the things that make the preacher cry. Uh, you thought that was going to be a sad message, but it, it wasn't. Uh, maybe for some people. But uh, anyway, I'm like that guy said, he's at a, at a, a fair somewhere, and this guy, you remember them old knife throwers? And he had this woman, it's a wall like this right here, and he's throwing them knives. Remember the old guys at the circus and stuff used to do that? And he threw them knives all the way around that woman and never hit her one time like that. And as a preacher went by and seen that, and he said, God help my preaching never to be like that. Just hit all around it and never hit it. Amen? And so if you come here to church, you're going to get the knife once in a while, right in the gut. Amen. <laughs> like old fatty over there in the chapter before us. Uh, he got it, buddy. Old lefty went, ooh, and stuck him with the sword of the spirit. And you're going to get it if you come. And you know what? I wouldn't give you a dime for a church or a preacher that didn't just cut my head off once in a while with the Bible. I mean, stab me. We, I'd rather him do it than have to face God one day and the Lord do it. So here we go. Chapter four. Everybody ready? Get your Bibles. I want you to keep your Bibles open because we're going to be looking over and over and over at this. I'm just going to read a lot of it because we will not have time to get it all. Verse 1. And the children of Israel again. There it is again. 
did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud, that king or the judge, was dead. Again, they did it again. You'd think people would learn, wouldn't you? You ever seen anybody that just keep getting in trouble and keep getting in trouble and keep getting arrested and keep getting charges and keep getting DUIs and keep, they did it again. Everyone, get, they did it again. You'd think people learn a lesson after a while, wouldn't you? You know what makes you learn a lesson? You get burnt bad enough, you'll learn one. A lot of people never learn a lesson because they don't get burnt bad enough. But, hello? Uh, <laughs> this is going to call him. Them stupid machine, one of them things. Verse 2, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. Now, what does that mean? The Lord sold them. Well, that's, you need to learn, you get familiar with phrases like that as you read the Bible. He didn't like say, well, I'm going to sell you these people. But in a sense, he delivered them over to a false king to rule over them. So like sold into slavery nearly. He, Jim's a popular man right now. Uh, but he's, got, he's probably some of their relatives and stuff with that, uh, with those funeral arrangements and stuff. But anyway, um, he sold them into the hand of a wicked king. He gave them over. You know what God will do? People don't agree with me on this, but these Old Testament stories are in there for a reason. If you do wrong, he'll let your enemies beat up on you a little bit. And that goes for a nation. You know why God let us get hit at 9-11? Ain't no doubt in my mind. If America would get right and repent, the Lord would protect us from our enemies. He did for years. And now, bam. And the old saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. This nation's just, we ain't seen nothing yet to what's coming. There's never been a nation got away with what our country's doing. Never. I'm telling you, we're going to get it, y'all. We're going to get it. We just, well, make up your mind. I just hope and pray we're gone first. And if we're not, let's be a witness through it all uh, of what all's coming. But he said that he sold them. Uh, you, you know how long he's, they wound up in, in bondage? 20 years. 20 years. We'll read that in, in a minute. 20 years, and then they got right and they delivered them. You know what the old saying is? Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. They rebelled against God and lived in slavery to another king 20 years. The old saying is, you reap what you sow and you reap more than you sow. You can put two grains of corn in the ground and reap eight or ten ears of corn. And that's the way it is about sin. You sow to the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. Our judicial system's like that. You know, you can commit a crime in five minutes that you pay for the rest of your life. You know that, right? It ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. And that's what they did. All right? Verse number two. That reigned in Hazar, and the captain of hosts was Sisera. We're going to study that guy again tonight. One of these wild stories are coming up. You've got to read this with me now, or you're not going to get nothing out of this. Get your Bible. Judges 4.2. Sisera, he's going to be the, one of the leading characters tonight and uh, with Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Here we go again. For he, that's Sisera, had 900 chariots of iron and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. That's Jabin, king of Canaan, and Sisera, his captain. Now, that 900 chariots of iron is very interesting. Sisera turns out to be a type of the Antichrist. There's 18 types of the Antichrist in the Bible, pictures of the Antichrist. One of the things you will remember when you read your Old Testament, you're not just reading a story of something happened a long time ago. It's, it has a prophetic implication, and we're going to see some of that tonight, and especially next week. Chapter 5 is all about the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why sometimes you read the Bible, you think, man, this is boring. It's because you're missing the prophetic. Like this story here, watch. Um, 900 chariots of iron. Now, I'm not going to do this tonight, but if you want a real Bible study, study iron, iron, the metal iron in the Bible. He had 900 iron chariots. There's a reason it said that. Those, one thing, iron chariots, you had to be a, a, a bad army to have them. They were a lot stronger than wood. They, were, they lasted a lot longer than wood. And they, them things were virtually 
impenetrable. You could, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't shoot, shoot a, 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 a rock or a spear through them. That's all they had then. Now think about it. If a man had a chariot of iron and it had iron all the way up both sides and then all you can see is his head and he's got, a, oh, that's a hard fellow to fight. And they said that on those, those chariot wheels that they had sharp daggers sticking out of their spokes. So when they spun like that, if you got close to one, they'd cut you all to pieces. I mean, them were some bad chariots. And they were made out of iron. If you want to study something, one of the earliest metals ever mined and, and dealt with or used was, was, was iron. In Genesis 4.22... Tubal Cain was a worker of iron. In Egypt, even before Moses' time, they used it. David, in 1 Chronicles 22, 3, used it building the temple. The merchants brought it to Tyre, Ezekiel 27, 19. It, they were made instruments out of it, hammers and tools. Deuteronomy 27, 5, 19, 5, Joshua 17, 16, 17, 18, 1 Samuel 17, 7, 2 Samuel 12, 31, 1 Samuel 6, 5. I'm reading these fast because we don't have time to look at all these. But they made instruments out of iron. And figuratively, figuratively, here's what iron meant in the Bible. Symbolic. It meant a yoke of iron, Deuteronomy 28, 48. That denotes hard service. A yoke of iron. He put a yoke of iron on them. There was a rod of iron, Psalm 2, 9. That denotes self or stern government. He'll, he'll rule them with a rod of iron. See, that's a strong government. Furnace of iron. Remember reading about the furnace of iron. That was Egypt in Deuteronomy 4, 20. That's severe labor like a labor concentration camp. Bars of iron, Job 40 and verse 18, uh, signifies strength. Fetters of iron, Psalm 107 verse 10, signifies affliction. And given a silver for, uh, for iron is Isaiah 60 and verse uh, 17, signifies prosperity. Now, uh, iron and clay mixed together in Daniel chapter 2 is in that image. All right, what you say, brother? That's right, that's right, you nailed it. Romans were famous for iron, and there's a reason for that too. You know, that de How many of y'all have ever read Daniel chapter two when Daniel saw an image and his head was gold and then his shoulders, neck was something else, brass or silver or something, uh, and then the, the metals got cheaper as it went on down and the head of gold, and it represents the kingdoms that were ruled all the way to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it said the legs, uh, I think down here, were iron, and then the toes and the feet were iron and clay. Now, if that iron represents Rome, that's the only kingdom that reached right on through. Uh, Greece didn't. Media Persia didn't. The old kingdoms, they're all gone. But Rome's still around. And it's mixed with clay. Clay's a picture of Humanity is just what's what we're made out of, dirt and clay. So brass is gone, the gold's gone, the bronze is gone, the silver is gone, but the, but the iron stayed. And uh, uh, that's why, it's my opinion, I, I, this is another Bible study, my opinion. I believe that in the tribulation, and maybe already, they're going to be experimenting mixing machine and humanity. They're already doing it. They're talking about now putting computers inside your head to make you think unbelievably uh, advanced humanity, and they say they're helping the evolution of man. I don't know. I don't know if iron is man-made. I don't think it is. Steel's man-made, yeah. Uh, but it, iron's, iron's mined. It, it sep you have to separate it from something, don't you? It's like it's mixed in with something, you have to separate it somehow or another. But uh, uh, I believe that it represents in the tribulation, and maybe before, there's going to be a mixture of machine and human. Hence, all the cartoons, Iron Man, all the kids know what Iron Man is.
Yeah. Yeah, I heard about that. Somebody sent me that. We're moving fast, buddy. We are moving fast. It's voluntary now. Mandatory a little bit later on. The only thing, the thing that will make it mandatory is an emergency. Because a lot of people say, no, you're not doing that to me. And so we're not going to make you. Then there's going to be an emergency. They say, now you have to. Let's just hope and pray the Lord comes before that day comes. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, they're, they're mixing. Like, like, that, like that chip, that's a, that's a machine, a little machine, putting it inside the human body. And they're talking about, you can look this up, putting about something to make your brain work better. Lord knows we could use that around here. Uh, but I don't, think, I don't think we need no help uh, from that because you're mixing iron and clay. As sons of God and daughters of men in Genesis 6, where there was a super race mixed with women and produced giants. Giants, man. People tall as that ceiling almost, or maybe even taller. They found bones of them like that. Smithsonian Institute or the science books won't tell you that, but they're there. And brother, they, they produced giants, and he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Same thing going on. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on. That's, that's about those chariots around, but I've got to move. I've got to, let's go here. It's going to be another one of them wild stories. You talk about a movie, brother, this could be one. And Deborah, verse number four, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, Lapidoth, Lapidoth. Uh, she judged Israel at that time. Now stop right here. This has been used from time and memoriam to justify women preachers and women pastors and women. See there, Deborah judged Israel and everything. Let me just say a couple things about this. Number one, nothing against ladies. Thank God for the ladies of the church. Number one, nothing in the book of Judges is done the way it's supposed to be done. Everything's out of whack in the book of Judges. God used, allowed Deborah to be a judge. Now let me show you something before you get all bent out of shape. Look at 315, chapter 3 and verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. There's a judge. Look at 3.9. The next, first one comes. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel. See? Look at, now look at chapter 4 and verse 4. And Deborah judged Israel at that time. It does not say the Lord raised her up to do that. Now, I'm saying that what happened here was, what happened here was, uh, God intends for men to be in the place of leadership. It always has. Does that mean women can't? No. And you know what? Most of the time, the men are so sorry and good for nothing, the women have to wind up doing it. And that could be what happened here. I, I preached in a lot of little old mountain churches, and brother, if it wasn't for the women, they'd go out of business. The women have to do everything because the men's too sorry. I know I've met a lot of uh, missionaries, young lady missionaries who go to the mission field and serve the Lord mission. And you know, a lot of times, because men won't even, men's so sorry they won't even do it. And the Lord will use a woman in a case like that. The Lord will use a child in a case. The Lord will use a rooster. The Lord will use a donkey. The Lord will use a fish. The, don't think like that, y'all. You're listening to the devil. Uh, <laughs> you're listening to the devil, I'm telling you. I ain't got a, I ain't got a, n no problem with women serving God, doing right, but I believe the Bible, and I believe the Bible teaches right. And this is what happened when it does not say the Lord raised her up and put her in that position. But he blessed her and used her. Thank God for it. And she prophesied. Verse 5. And she dwelled under the palm tree of Deborah. Now what they, them Old Testament judges, they would sit under a palm tree. That would be like in your lounge chair out on your sun deck or something back then. Under a palm tree. And, uh, and she judged. And the children of Israel came to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak the son of 
Abinoam out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go, draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the of children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? And I will draw thee to the river Kishon. That's the river that goes through what's called the Valley of Armageddon. Uh, verse 6, it's talking about... Uh, the valley of Armageddon. This is a picture of the last battle there at the end of the tribulation. I'll draw them out. And he said, verse uh, Kishon, that's the river that goes through where the valley of Arm uh, battle of Armageddon is, is going to be. And his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So she said this. She said, we're going to take these 10,000 men down here, and we're going to get that Sisera out here. And God said, I'm going to deliver him. We're going to, since y'all have prayed and got right, and I, Deborah, am the judge now, we're going to go knock that guy off his throne and liberate the children of God. God's going to deliver us. Amen. Hallelujah. Now the plot thickens. Watch. Watch this. And verse 8, And Barak said unto her, if thou wilt go with me, then I will go. Lord, there's a pit pitiful state of the men right there. Here's Barak, but the leader, suppose, he, Deborah says, let's go get them. We're going to take over them. He said, well, if you'll go with me. Ain't that sad. That's like the bill collector calling, and the man gives the woman the phone and says, here, you talk to them. I've known something like that. I've known me. I've had... Bunches of ladies call, preacher, can can you help us with our power bill? And I'll say, How much is it? She'll say, How much is it? And he's laying on the couch. $185. Here's $185. I want to say, that's how come you can't pay your power bill. Sorry, man won't even get in there and own up, man up a little bit and face his debts. I feel sorry for that woman. Having to pay the bills. Now, man, won't even, isn't that pitiful? He said, I'll go, but you got to go with me, Deborah. That's like, somebody's breaking in. Honey, you go see who it is. <laughs> Good night, people. Listen, I've been scared a few times, but there's something in me you ain't going to send no woman to the door when somebody's beating on it, cussing and screaming and hollering. That's how pitiful Israel had got in this day. He said, if you'll go with me, the plot thickens. Verse, then I will go. But if not, then I will not go. Ain't that something? He said, I ain't going if you don't go. Verse 9. And she said, get out and do it, you sorry good for nothing thing. No. She said, I will surely go with thee. Notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Ain't that something? The woman, woman winds up killing him. Woman winds up killing that guy. We'll see here in just a minute. And Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Here's Deborah leading the charge against the army. Now Heber, I wonder what this Deborah girl looked like. I think she's probably had arms that big and come out like that and says, Big Bertha coming at you. I don't know if she did that or not. Probably not. But uh, uh, she is not mad at me. She had to leave. Ain't that right, Miss Sherry? <laughs> See you. Uh, but anyway, I can imagine, uh, here comes Deborah out. Come on, boys. <laughs> and, and they go out here and fight this battle. That's crazy. That's crazy. But, and look what she done. Look here in verse number 10. 10,000 men went with him. Good night, Lord. If you had 10,000 people. Yeah. Verse 11. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself. He backslid and got away. Oh, no, he got, right, got away from the Kenites and pitched his tent under the plain of Zanim, which is by Kadesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera, verse 13 gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth to the Gentiles to the river Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, get up, let's go. This is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. All right, stop right there. Here's this girl jumps up, and she said this. 
She said, let's go, boys. God done went out before us. Now, there's another Old Testament phrase. If you read your Bible, you're going to see it over and over and over. The Lord has gone out before you. The Lord has gone out before you. We need to learn that. There was a time when we believed that in this country. There was a time when our leaders used to get together and pray, and they said, God, are you with us in this battle? If not, we don't want to go. And the Lord, what does, the Lord, what does that mean, the Lord went out before them? I'm telling you, buddy, when you go into a fight and the Lord doesn't go ahead of you, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Bam! Just knock them flat. And I would hate to be on the other end of that thing. I'd hate to be fighting somebody that the Lord was on their side against me. And that's the way it used to be. People used to think that about America. They thought it about Israel until Israel sinned. And when they sinned, God pulled back his blessings and power and that's exactly what's happened to the United States of America. We think we're so smart. We think we can cuss God and forget his day, kick the Bible out of school, kick the prayer out of school, embrace every religion in the world and claim they're all the same, let two men marry, and then God's still going to bless America? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. It don't work like that, y'all. It don't work like that. But you know what she said? The Lord has gone out before you. Now, what does he mean by that? Uh, uh, he discomforted them. Uh, this happens in David's time. The Lord went out before him. So I reckon the Holy Spirit goes out here and messes with their mind or something, confuses their plan. One time he sent hornets. He sent hornets. You remember reading that? The Lord sent hornets. But it's pretty hard to fight a battle when you got hornets, one in your ear and one in your nose and one in your eye. And stay. Oh, Ethan and I got stung a bunch today, buddy. Ask him, did he feel like doing a wrestling match? I had him a weed eating down there and he hit the, hit the yellow jacket's nest. And I thought I was going to hit it. I'd done that whole valley, and I thought there's going to be yellow jackets. There's going to be yellow jackets. And there wasn't, and he found them today. And you ain't going to be doing much fighting with hornets stinging you in the eyes. And the Lord sent hornets. He sure did. He sent hailstones one time. God did. He demoralized the enemy. He discomfited them. What does that mean? Look at verse 15. And the Lord discomfited Learn how those Bible words, you see that word pop up over and over in the Bible. What, somebody tell me how easy, hard that is to understand. Discomforted. Comfort, discomfort, you know, makes you miserable. God did it, not them. I'll tell you a good one. He took the chariot wheels off Pharaoh's chariots. Ain't that something? Here's Pharaoh and him going to fight. Well, you're just as good as you is. Our God going to help us. Bam! The Lord says, boop, and took the chariot wheels off. That's something else. Now listen, for me and you today, the Lord can fight our battles if we'll live right and serve. You put God first and honor him. He'll fight your battles for you. Now it'd be nice if he just went out and smote everything that would come against us. He ain't gonna do that. He's gonna let you get your nose blooded once in a while. But he will fight your battles if you'll, you'll trust him. Amen? That's great. That's great. So here we go now. We're in this big battle. And Sisera thought he would win, and they come, and all of a sudden these wheels fell off. <coughs> Their wheels fell off. <coughs> Ran in the ditch. <coughs> they hit a parking curb. <coughs> they went in Walmart through the front glass. <coughs> this one turned to flip. <coughs> that went off in the creek, and they, he took their wheels off. So the children of Israel just come in and started smiting them, buddy. Verse 16. Barak pursued the chariots after the host unto Herosheth the Gentiles and all the host of Syria fell on the edge of the sword and there was not a man left. Killed every blessed one of them. And he took off running on foot. Buddy, that's bad. When the leader goes on foot, verse 17, on foot, and he wound up to go to jail, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite, for there was peace between Jabin and the king of Hazor in the house of Heber, the Canaanite. I'm reading fast because we've got to get to this story. Verse 18. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me. Fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. TV plot one. Listen. Here goes the man. He's running for his life. He comes to the tent. A beautiful woman comes to the door. He says, Can you help me? I'm, yes, sir. Come on in. I'll take care of you. I'll, and then she's going to kill him. She kills him. And acts like she's his friend. See? 
forensic files. You're going to look something that boring when you got a Bible with a real thing. You're going to watch something like them LMN movies, them Lifetime movies. All Lifetime movies are is a cheap imitation of the stories in that book right there. There's only 33 original plots. Betrayal, murder, love, lust, jealousy, hate, money, thief, and all 33 of them are right here in your King James Bible. All Hollywood does is imitate what they re see in this book. They're so jealous of that book, that's why they preach against it all the time. They hate it. They're jealous of it. And buddy, there's your book. There's your exciting book right there. Lord, now, but you've got to use your imagination. People are too lazy to do that. They won't sit there and let the TV do all the thinking for them. But I, man, I, I, can see, I can see him come into the tent and knock on the door. Hey, Miss Jail, I'm in trouble. Can you help me? And she says, sure, come on in. I can, can I get you anything? And he's going to say in the next verse, he's going to say, I'm so thirsty, I'm about to die. Can I have some water? She says, I'll open the refrigerator. I'll get you some milk in a lordly dish. That's what it says in the next chapter. Fixed him buttermilk and cornbread. And said, now I know cornbread, but she gave him some buttermilk. And, uh, and uh, I'm reading ahead of myself, so let's go. Uh, look at verse number 18. She covered him with a mantle. And he laid down all covered up. And he said unto her, verse 19, I pray thee, give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk. See how nice she's treating him? He said, man, she must like me. I think she likes me. You know, they say if, if you ask a woman for something, then she offers something. She's like, she likes me. Oh, you brought me milk. Boy, what a fool, man. What a fool. He's a fool for trusting that woman to start with, wasn't he? She had the nail back in the bedroom she's going to put through his head. <whistles> Ain't been a many a man went down like that. Good Christian woman here nailed him. <laughs> Brother, I tell you what. Uh, uh, and the Lord was in it. I can't answer that. But that, here we go. The music starts playing. She opened a bottle of milk. And gave him that. Found me a girlfriend and brought me some milk. Everybody else is dead. But I got it made. I'm laying here stretched out on the couch, turning the TV on. You got Netflix? I love uh, and, and, and she says, just make yourself at home, sir. I'll protect you. And then he says, now, if anybody comes and knocks on the door, you tell me, nobody here. Got you. What it said? Look at verse 20. And he said, stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire thee, says any man here, say, no. You got that? She says, no problem. Well, there ain't going to be nobody here in this little bit. <laughs> But you don't know that. <laughs> I'm fixing to pierce, give you a piercing, dude. Uh, you're going to love it. Now watch what happens. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent. It wasn't just a little bitty five-penny nail. It was a nail of the tent. One that you have to, you'd be down in there to hold the ropes. That was one of them nine-inch nails, like the rock group mocks the nails that put Jesus on the cross. Railroad spike, brother. Bigger around than, bigger around than my finger and that long. And he's in there. He's dreaming him in jail getting married. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. She, she comes in there. But the hammer, that's a rough lady right there, but he laying down like this, and she puts that nail right here. There's one for Hollywood. Puts that nail right here. She says, all right, boy. Good night. This is over. Bam! And it goes probably about that far in him. And it hits it again. Bam! He's awake by now, kicking. And she drives it into the floor. So if he's alive, if he's alive, his head's down to the floor and he's doing like this. I doubt if he's doing anything. She, <laughs> she drove a nail through that dude's head, people. 
Look here what it said. She smoked. She went softly, real, real quiet. And she smoked the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground. Gosh, man, I don't know if I could do that, man. I had some rough ladies back in them days, didn't they? One of them led the whole army and another one nailed the, the opposition. He was fast asleep, so he died. I reckon he did. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come here, I'll show you the man you're looking for. Dunn took care of him. He came into the tent. Sisera lay, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day. See, it's going off now. The music's playing. Da, da, da. So God subdued that day the king of Canaan before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed and lived. That's why movies all live happily ever after. It ends with a guy riding off. Here goes jail and her husband off on a date that night. Sisera's dead, the army's dead, enemy's dead, and Israel's free. Everybody's happy and right with God. See? That's where it comes from. Now, chapter 5, we're going to talk about next week, is a song about this. A hit song. Jail with the nail. Jail with the nail. So I don't know how. I had a rap. I don't know. Jail took the nail. Sent him to hell. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll scratch that. Just kidding. But uh, he's out on bail. Jail got the nail. <laughs> he ain't got no story to tell. All right. Uh, now let's look at this guy just a second and I'm done. What's, what's the whole point in this? There's a million things happened back then. Why'd God put that in the Bible? Because Sisera is a type of the Antichrist and the Antichrist dies by a wound to the head. This started in Genesis 3.15 when God gave the promise to, to Adam and Eve. He'll bruise your heel, thou shalt bruise his head. Remember that? That goes all the way through the Bible. I think the devil sometimes shakes a little bit when he reads them scriptures. Think about that. He got it in the head. Abimelech, listen to this and I'm through. Abimelech got it in the head by a woman with a millstone. Now, you reckon, this just hit me this evening. You reckon the, it might be a woman who maybe kills an antichrist? It could be Hillary. I don't know. It could be one of them women from overseas. I, I don't even know if it would be, but that's, it's weird that two times it's a woman that brings that wound to that type of antichrist head. That's a weird thing, isn't it? Now, David kills Goliath, the type of the antichrist, with a wound to the head. It's over and over and over. You know what God's doing? He's saying, this is what's coming. This is what's coming. This is what's coming. It's prophetic. It's prophetic, y'all. Jesus died on the cross with them nails. The Antichrist. Oh, let's look at it this way. He said, thou shalt bruise his head, but he, he'll bruise your head. When the Lord comes back, guess who he's got with him? His bride, a woman. Male Antichrist. Maybe we'll get to do it. I don't know. The end. Got jail. Jail. Sisera. Jimmy Short. Yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, who's jail? Kelly. Donna. <laughs> the words are going up over the stream. It's over. All right. Anybody got a question? We'll stop right there. Yeah, I done give her some ideas, ain't I? You better go home and hide the hammer, brother. Better hide the hammer. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon. It was God's will for her to, to hit him in, in the head with a hammer. Ladies, don't. <laughs> you say, oh, boy, I've been looking for that for years. <laughs> Don't. I know some. I know a woman that did that. Who was it? Oh, used to come here to church. Remember? Didn't she hit her husband with a hammer? Yeah, yeah. 
There used to be a, a couple here that used to come to church. She hit him with a hammer. Just in the next chapter, chapter 5, it's going to sing the song about her. It's a good song. We're going to sing it next week. <laughs> 